Hello and welcome to my clip on Hess's Law. Um, first of all, I just want to quickly explain why we use Hess's Law before we go on to what Hess's Law is. Um, the idea behind it came from an Austrian chemist quite some time ago. Um, I can't remember exactly what time, I think at least 150 years ago, so it's that sort of era, called Henri Hess. And uh, his idea was that because some reactions are difficult to measure the uh, temperature change for, then it's going to be quite difficult to work out the delta R H value. In other words, it's going to be hard to do Q equals MC delta T. So he came up with the idea that in a chemical reaction, if you can't measure the temperature change for the direct route, you can go via a series of indirect routes to get from one set of reactant to reactants to a set of products. So therefore, the indirect route will end up with the same total enthalpy change as the direct route. If the indirect route has, has stages in it that are more easy to measure the temperature change for, then surely it's just as easy to add up um, the delta H values for stages, the indirect stages, than it is to try and work out the temperature change for the direct route, where it's more difficult to measure. So these will be two examples of um, simple calorimeters where it's easy to measure the temperature change. But obviously not every single reaction is quite so convenient. Some reactions it's very difficult to measure the temperature change, so you have to use an alternative approach. And that's where Hess's law came in. So what um, Hess said is that an enthalpy change for a reaction where you've got two different possible routes which both start and end with the same conditions, will be the same for both routes. So let's uh, try and illustrate this a little bit. If you have two reactants, A and B, and you turn them into C and D, let's call the direct route delta R H 1. You could also perhaps go via E. And F like this. So let's call A to B going to E to F. Let's call that delta R H 2. Let's call the third one delta R H 3. So, what you've got to now think about is what's the direct route and what's the indirect route. So, the direct route So we've now got two possible routes. We've got route 1, which is the direct route from A, to B, sorry, A and B going to C plus D. Or we've got um, route 2, which goes from A to B through E to F and then over to C to D. So in other words, the delta R H2 plus delta R H3 is going to be the same as delta R H1. So if you can measure the delta T value for these two, but you can't measure the delta T value for this one, then you can work out delta R H1 
by adding them up. So it's like a shortcut by going a slightly different route from your reactants to your products. So in order to put Hess's law into practice, you need to draw a Hess's law diagram. Now, this is where the trick comes. There's two types of Hess's law diagram that look very similar. So if you very carefully look at the data that the question gives you. So if an exam question gives you combustion or formation data <clears throat> and asks you to calculate a quote-unquote impossible delta RH value, you've got to remember that it's only impossible if you try and do it using the direct route. So what I'm going to do is draw out the two different types of Hess's law cycles that you could be ending up drawing. So the first one is using combustion data. So this would be an example of an impossible to measure um, change, taking some carbon and some hydrogen and directly combining them together in the correct ratios to make butane. It's actually a very difficult reaction to do in that particular circumstance, so it's obviously going to be quite difficult to measure its temperature. But it could theoretically happen. But what we can do is actually burn some carbon and burn some hydrogen and separately burn some, uh, some butane. So if we now put down the data that the question would provide you with, we can construct a Hess's law cycle and do the calculation. So assuming it gives us these values, these values are for the combustion of carbon, of hydrogen and of butane. So what you do is uh, at the bottom, underneath your reaction, you write in the combustion products of the um, the reactants and the products that you've got. So let me show you what I mean. So notice I've done it in the same mole quantities, so four carbons will make four carbon dioxides, five hydrogens will make five waters, and one butane will make both four carbon dioxides and five waters, because all butane is is a rearrangement of four C and five H2. So what we can do now is to draw an arrow from the reactants to the combustion products and also from the product to our combustion products. So just to remind you, there are actually two routes, aren't there? There's a direct route going straight across and there's an indirect route which we're going to try and work out, which is easier to measure. So taking our values, um, we have four carbons being burnt to make carbon dioxide. So we need to put the relative numbers in. So if we work out the total energy required to burn everything on the left-hand side, it would be minus 3006. So now we've got to do the same for burning our butane. So because we didn't actually have to multiply butane up at all, it's just one butane being produced, then we can just simply take the data from the bottom of the page and put in minus 2887. Now if we look at the black arrow, you'll see that it follows the direction of the blue arrow going from 4C to 5, uh, and 5H2 down to 4O2. So you use the same sign as your calculator gave you, your minus 3006. When it curves round and it starts to point towards butane, you'll notice it goes in the opposite direction to the blue, blue, blue arrow from butane to 5H2O. So if you're adding up all of your energies, you have to reverse the sign if you're going against the direction of reaction. So the direction of reaction from butane to H2O and 4CO2 is uh, downwards, but your black arrow, your indirect route, is going upwards. So you don't use the minus sign, you use just 2887 because it's the opposite direction to the reaction. So the reaction being C4H10 going down to 4CO2 and 5H2O. So that's essentially how you do it. Now there's another set of data they could give you. They could give you formation data that requires a slightly different approach. Very similar idea, but the way you draw out your Hess's law diagram is going to be a little bit different. 
So let's look briefly at the data that we've been given. The formation enthalpy for um, iron oxide is minus 824. Uh, for calcium oxide it's minus 635. But you'll notice that for calcium and for iron as elements it's zero. So elements are always given an, uh, a formation enthalpy of zero because they've been there since the inception of the universe. So therefore, because they don't have to be formed as such from anything else, and they're there already, there's no energy requirement needed to make them. So we give them a zero value, and, and elements are always zero value. So what do we do with our reaction? So the direct route is hard to measure, isn't it? So if we now think of forming all of these um, reactants and products from their elements, instead of writing out the oxides, like carbon dioxide and water that we did on the left-hand side, let's now write out the individual elements. So let's see how many um, of each element we've got. So we've got two irons, we've got one and a half O2s, so three oxygen atoms, that makes our iron oxide, and then we've got three calciums. So let's just put that in and we'll see where we are so I can explain to you why that would work. So from those elements, we can now make iron oxide, or we can make calcium oxide and iron. So in other words, we can take two iron two irons, one and a half oxygen molecules and three calciums to make either one iron oxide and three calciums or we can take those same ingredients and we can make two irons and three calcium oxides. So again we have a direct route or an indirect route and again we can apply the data to each side. So you can see I've now put in 800, minus 824 on the left hand side um, and minus 1905 on the right hand side because I'm ignoring the three calciums because I don't need them because they're zero. I'm ignoring the two irons because they're also zero. What I have to pay attention to though is the direction of travel of my black arrow, my indirect route. Now if you look on the left hand side this time it's automatically going against the direction of minus 824 so we can turn it into plus 824 on the right hand side it's going in the same direction as minus 1905 so we can keep that as minus 1905 so let's put in the calculation okay so starting from Fe2O3 plus 3Ca I've flipped the sign of minus 824 and turned it into positive 824 because I'm going against the direction of the red arrow following the direction round on my black arrow I'm now going from um, 2Fe to 1.502 and 3Cas back up again to the top right hand corner which is 2Fe and 3Ca. Oh, this time I'm going in the same direction as the red arrow pointing up. So I keep my minus sign. So it's 800, 824 plus 3 lots of minus 635 gives us minus 1081 kilojoules per mole. And that, in a nutshell, folks, is how you do Hess's Law diagrams. Simple as that. So it's worth going back over this a couple of times before you start trying some examples on the homeworks and the past papers. So thanks for listening once more. And any tips, any extra help you need, just get in touch with me. Thanks a lot. Bye.